<laughs> welcome, welcome to another edition of Everyone Hates Cleveland, the podcast where we actually have news to talk about today. Uh, the Cleveland Indians did a slew of things today, uh, the biggest of which was trading away Jan Gomes to the Washington Nationals for, God, I can't. Can't even remember for who they traded for. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, we'll get into the who's and the what's it's, but they also signed Danny Salazar. Uh, they tendered Danny Salazar. They ten- tendered Nick Goody. They tendered Neil, Gonz- Neil Ramirez. They tendered a bunch of people. Um, but of course, the big news is the fact that they they traded <clears throat> they traded Jan Gomes to the Nationals uh, for Jeffrey Rodriguez and Daniel Johnson. You know, Rodriguez, a reliever. Who debuted this year? <laughs> and her, if you really want a fun, a fun small sample, check out Jeffrey Rodriguez's statistics for 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 2018. Or done. Um, and, <laughs> and, and, and or yeah, uh, and uh, Daniel Johnson, who uh, is a double A player right now, uh, center fielder, uh, right fielder, depending on who you listen to and who who you've looked at so far. Uh, as we jump into this discussion, I, I want to start before we jump into the players and the trade. Let's start with Jan Gomes for a second. Um, of course, uh, the Indians acquired him in a, in a great move by Chris Antonetti, uh, trading, um, good lord, Esmil Rogers. Man, that what, they traded? what a fun yeah. he was! Yeah, fun. They, 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 they picked up Rogers, I think, the same year they got, uh, or the year before they got Yvaldo, and then they, they, after using him for a year, they dealt him to Toronto for Mike Avilas, if I recall correctly, uh, Jan Gomes, and I think they got someone else too. But uh, Gomes was was obviously a diamond in the rough there, a, kind of a multiple use player back then for Toronto. Uh, Indians capitalized on him at catcher. Uh, it's a win deal for the Indians um, over his tenure, obviously. Uh, but we've <laughs> we've. You know, I, I don't know, guys, you know, over the past five years, I know, Mike, you and I have done this a lot. And I know the three of us have done this as well. We've speculated on on the uh, shift at catcher for the Indians for, I think, the past three or four years. Uh, now we're forced into that. And I, I don't know, maybe I'll miss that discussion. Um, but your thoughts on Jan Gomes um, over his tenure and uh, what the Indians at the big league level at catcher are going to do. And I'm going to start with you, Mike, because I think um, obviously – uh, the obvious move is uh, after trading Gomes probably makes you internally very happy and probably externally very happy in a second as soon as I shut up. Yeah. What, what, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Hold the – what the hell? You For <laughs> two years, Eric Haas, Eric Haas, Eric Haas, okay. you finally get the floor after two years. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think he's like – I think he has a good role on a big league team. And I'm going to play devil's advocate here, an unlikable person. Wait, wait, wait. wait. That, I feel. <laughs> uh, to me, being unlikable is really something I revel in. <laughs> my wife disagrees with my life choices. But here it is. Um, you know, I think, I think Young Gones is really integral. I think he's great. I really hope he plays well in Washington. I think there are a couple of caveats, but I think the first is I think we saw a 2018 that doesn't seem super repeatable. He's in his early 30s as a catcher with a lot of wear and tear. Um, He was hot garbage in 2016 and 2017. (laughs) Um, And I think a lot of how you view this trade comes down to how you view framing numbers and whether you think Roberto Perez can be productive if he's not just playing like once every 12 days. Um, I think there's really good evidence to suggest that Perez is one of the five best framers in baseball and Jeff Mathis keeps getting jobs because people think that's an insanely valuable skill. Um, so I think in that respect, I think there's a really good argument to be made for the fact that like having Perez elevates your pitching staff or really helps it. And so you can put up with the bad offense. And two, I'm obviously higher on Haas than a lot of people because I'm really high on guys who make adjustments when they're developing, guys who show the cognitive and athletic ability to make an adjustment and say, hey, I want to make it to the big leagues and I know I need to do these things. So, hey, I'm going to go spend the entire offseason working on a hit FX machine, which shows me whether I'm elevating the ball, hitting it well, 
and like altering my launch angle and fixing my swing so that the contact point is more effective. So I think, to me, I think Haas, you know, he's not a superstar. Do I think he can put up like a couple of years of 95 WRC plus with 20 homers and solid defense? Yeah, I think he could do that. And I think he can do it for really cheap. But I don't care about saving the Dolan's money if we're not spending the seven million on Gomes this off season. Like I don't care about that. <laughs> so you have to spend the Gomes money for me to say, okay, I understand this. Johnson and and Rodriguez aside, and I think Gage has read way more on Rodriguez uh, than I have. So I'll kick it to Gage for Rodriguez, and then Jim should definitely break down Johnson because I've just had a nice IPA for the last hour. <laughs> Well, I do want to add something about – I've been kind of down on Gomes, and I, I jumped back on board this past year because it looked like he turned it around a little bit. But I don't think it was as much as about 2019 as escalations in 2020 and 2021 on his contract. Like a get out and take the, take the loss in 2019 on the Gomes front so that you can – salvage the potential loss that could happen in 20 and 20 and 2021 it's it seems like a risk play to me aside from the obvious caveat that mike mentioned of saving the dole and some money but uh, jim do you want to get back and you want to go over what the return was real quick yeah the return the indians um got three players back in the deal two right now the two players they got was uh, Jeffrey Rodriguez, who was a starter uh, for much of his minor league career, but moved to the bullpen, um, at least this year with the Nationals, um, started some games for them and ended up in the bullpen. Um, and, you know, a flame-throwing, uh, I think, right-hander. And then uh, Daniel, John- Daniel Johnson, uh, a center field prospect for the for the Nationals with some pop. Um, he was the – and, you, you know, I mean – we can talk about minor league player of the year for an organization. You know, he was the 2017 nationals minor league player of the year, whatever that means. And of course, and this is my favorite. He was, <laughs> he's their number one power hitting prospect. They must yeah. really, they must really, <laughs> they must really suck in the minors for, for power hitting. If he's their number one guy. Anyway, I'm not saying he doesn't have pop, but Holy cow. I mean, so I, I and again I'm not I'll get into him because I've been watching a lot of video over the past hour, um, but I I want to start with probably the guy that's not been talked about a lot mainly because, um, I think we didn't know about the other guy. We it's it was a weird trade from jump. Uh, you know I forget who who was who Mike who who broke the story today. Some rando dude from Washington, like had the like some like rando blogger with three thousand followers, yeah. and then it just like kind of kept building. But it was like three hours of just waiting. Yeah. Well, and and after that came out, then we find out that the Mets and the Dodgers were kind of hot and heavy for Gomes, and you, you kind of got the impression that you know the timing was right for this deal. Um, but we didn't, you know, Jeff Jeffrey Rodriguez's name was mentioned right out of the gate. Uh, and then he sort of disappeared. Uh, I think he was in a Heyman piece, uh, and then that disappeared out of the Heyman piece, and then uh, comes comes in uh, really within the past hour that he was actually part of the deal. I think Hoynes actually, <laughs> Paul Hoynes actually broke that. Um, he was actually in the deal along with a player to be named, one of those infamous player to be named later, where everybody's probably thinking we're getting another Brantley, but that's for another day to discuss. All right, let's talk about. Um, Jeffrey Rodriguez, uh, obviously the Indians need arms in the bullpen. And, you know, we've talked a lot about, you know, having these kind of high upside velocity guys. Gage, seems to me that we got ourselves a high velocity upside guy here. Yeah, well, I first want to point out the Nationals have never toyed with him in the pen. Maybe until this past year, a couple times. He's been starting in the minors his whole career. And yep. he's really interesting to me because – I basically think um, – don't look at the 2018 statistics. They're bad. They're <laughs> brutal. But I think you take this as a flyer for the potential to be that seventh or eighth inning guy, the type that can really help you down the stretch. And as we saw in 2016 in a playoff run, I, I don't know if we'll have that kind of impact. But 
uh, his fastball darts a lot of arm side action, 96 plus. And he's got a really, really solid curveball. It's just a matter of honing in on the command. And I, I'm, ge- I'm guessing that they are hoping that they can play up the fastball and curveball in a pen roll and just bank on trying to find something that clicks for him command wise. He was a huge prospect in the, well, I don't know about huge, but he was a top 10 type guy a couple of years ago in the Nats system and he faded out. But maybe not top 10, top 20, but seems like he's kind of faded from that view. So I think I, the Indians um, saw something think, with the fastball. I think some some people still thought he was a top 10 guy just based on, on the velocity that he had. Um, I think this year, as you mentioned, Gage, the, the kind of shuffling to the pen – um, as he was struggling, I think confused him. Um, I don't know. I, again, a high upside arm. I, I, I love. I, I, I we'll talk about value in a second, but um, it seems to be a guy who's going to fit with this team um, very well. Uh, Gage, real quick um, before before I skip over to Mike, um, what are your thoughts on? I mean, the guy everybody's been talking about is um, Daniel Johnson, and. We've sort of been bantering about. I guess, Mike, I'll go to you with this, just because you know we've we we've kind of made some similar comments early earlier on him. I mean, over the past you know four or five months, the Indians have made a lot of real really rando moves, bringing in these fringy like quad A seeming um, center field guys like Mercado. Um, now you know Johnson and who am I forgetting? I'm forgetting someone. But anyways. Um, what, what are your thoughts just just out of the gate on on the potential of Daniel Johnson just to, as far as fit in this and maybe down the road? I mean, obviously he's never been higher than Double A, um, so he's probably not a guy we see in 2019. But um, you know, is this just a, a flyer and a lottery ticket? Yeah, I mean, I think he's a good prospect in that like there are multiple tools that look like interesting especially i think you'll talk about it but probably more in a corner i mean he has power that's popped in the past he's not super old he played all of this season in double a at 22 years old which is a positive thing he didn't look completely overmatched he had a 103 wrc plus strikeouts weren't that bad they were decent power kind of went away i mean i don't know I, I want to well, point out he was battling injury from everything that I, I yeah. gathered. Yeah, he had he had um he had the same injury that Greg Allen had um, last year, the hamate bone problem. So he he missed a, a legit amount of time, and obviously that sapped away some of his power. Um, you know, I've read a ton of reports, and I hate reading reports on a guy when I've never seen him play, and I watched a ton of video. He seems to profile. Um, he's got an interesting profile because he's got that, you know, if, depending on where you look, he's got that, you know, 70 speed and, um, you know, they say he's got a good arm. I've yet to see the arm, so I can't make any comments on that. Um, I've seen some defensive plays of him in right field that, that are very interesting. Um, he seems to have uh, um, a good feel for playing right field. I, you know, I, I just threw a couple of videos your guys' way earlier today with him. Um, robbing, you know, balls in, in right field. And when you can get two or three of those in the minors, that does let you know that he does have some skill as far as it's just kind of having a feel for the game in the outfield, especially when you consider the fact that he predominantly plays in center. Um, he's got this weird profile, this tweener profile, where a lot of people say he can't defend in center field as well as he can in right, but he doesn't have the pop in right field to be a right fielder. Therefore, everybody thinks he's a, a fourth outfielder utility guy, which is fine, I guess, at the end of the day. Um, you know, I, I, I guess we can talk about value for Gomes in a second, but, um, I don't, I just, I guess my thing is, is when you, when you're a world series contender, um, why are you trading away players and not getting back immediate returns? And, you know, Michael Taylor, the guy, all three of us speculated on today, uh, Gage, I'll throw it to you first. You know, was it a big miss not getting a guy like Taylor? I just don't know if the value is there. We've been speculating about Gomes's value all 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 off season, and Gomes or Hattery had a great piece on it. I I just thought the range of outcomes on his value was pretty large with the twenty million owed after twenty nineteen. So 
I was hoping it'd be Taylor because that's an impact bat in day one. It's just hard to sell me on a guy whose arrival is 2020 at the earliest right now. I know they're trying to shed some salary and kind of keep that vaunted window propped open, but it's just kind of a – the Indians have a type, don't they? I mean, isn't this the same thing as Zimmer, like this same, this profile? Will Benson, like, don't they all fit into the same kind of mold, like quick, long swings that might be able to pop at some point? I don't know. It's like, it's sort of fascinating, right? Because, like, they have all these stars who, like, Brantley when he popped, Lindor, Ramirez, Diaz are all guys. I mean, Diaz is not a star. Nobody take that out of context, you bastards. And I'm fine <laughs> with that staying in the podcast. Um, I, was like, I was like, dang it. <laughs> but I, you know, like all those guys run like sub 15% K ranges. I, you know, I do want to go back. I'm piggybacking because I always drive the dialogue in crazy places, but I'm struck by something with Rodriguez. And it's something that sort of like sticks out to me that Gage mentioned, but first I'm going to tie it back to who. So I wrote this story about who who we acquired from the Rays, and I don't want to pronounce his entire name because I'll mispronounce it, and I find that to be fundamentally rude. Um, but I wrote this story, and then within like 24 hours, I had like someone within the organization, and then I had someone who had been a beat writer who was like involved in covering who from the Rays, who talked about like how they think he was sort of this like distressed asset because he was caught in between like the organization player development and the big league level. And they think he's sort of really going to be unlocked in Cleveland just from a stuff standpoint, there's a ton of upside and he was caught in between. And I really wonder um, with Rodriguez, you know, what Gage pointed out, which is this guy was never a reliever at any level. And then he tries it for like eight or nine games and definitely struggles with the nationals this year, but he's someone with really interesting stuff, wants a top prospect. And so the question is, like, if you limit his arsenal, if you take him down to two pitches, if you're just going fastball, curveball, or fastball, slider, like, is this just a guy who's a distressed asset caught in between that you can unlock? I think for an organization that, like, hasn't put very many interesting bullpen arms or, leave, like, upside arms in AAA in a long time, like, we've been pumping out guys who throw 90 to 93 in AAA for, like, 10 friggin' years. And it's like, oh, he's got a nice arm angle. That's really exciting. And so now we're seeing them say, hey, let's go buy a guy who throws 97 miles per hour or tops out there with a decent secondary offering and see if we can get the rest to where it needs to be. So I think that, to me, is one of the more fascinating like subtexts of this deal. Um, so the Gomes thing. The value of Gomes, you know, because I was ready to jump off a bridge earlier today. But the, the, as I listen to you two talk and I think about value, um, what were we? I mean, so first of all, Mike, in your piece trading on Gomes, you know, you were talking about, you know, 40 great players, 50 great players. And I've seen Johnson graded out at 45, which kind of fits right into the wheelhouse of what you're talking about. You know, did we, did we, I mean, and again, you know, looking at it just from an organizational standpoint, value versus value. Um, is this not a win for the Indians? I mean, at the end of the day, you know, you have a, a, pitch, a catcher in Jan Gomes who for two years struggled. He did have an all-star season last year. There's no doubt about it, a resurgence. But at 31, heading into his third, age 32 year, you know, did we not perhaps, you know, in getting out of the salary, isn't this sort of a win? And we still don't know the player to be named later. I mean – the perfect world is we get a, you know, maybe a major league guy right now, which is kind of what you were speculating on. We didn't get that, but it does feel like we got perhaps that at least a year from now with a, a wild card in Rodriguez potentially uh, falling into that role at some point this year as a bullpen arm. Yeah, I think the big thing, I, I can't get over – we, we want to talk about his value and see if he can return a major league ready prospect. But this time next year, that guy has no value, even if he replicates this past season. A 32 year old catcher with 20 million owed over the next two years looks a lot worse than a 31 year old catcher with 7 million owed in the following year and 20 the next two after that. So maybe this was just more of a outside of the salary dump implications and insinuations, which 
I, I don't really want to get into the merits of those. That's a long road. But maybe this was a more of a we're never going to have this value again in the future. And let's see if we can make something out of it now rather than. So maybe it wasn't about finding a guy who contributes now, but selling that asset before another debilitating or another injury that cuts his 2018 short or anything along those lines. I, I don't know. I, I still think it was a risk management play more than anything, which kind of looks sour now when you're competing for the 2019 title. I'll kick it over to Hattery for his input, but. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think like one of the interesting things with Gums was, you know, if they don't pick up his option next year, you have a million dollar buyout. So you have 8 million guaranteed to a guy. And I think that there's just like, if you value framing, I think there's a really significant question as to whether the $8 million to play Gomes a ton and play Perez 50 games was really worth it. If there was actually any value add over the top. And I think that's a really legitimate question, I think. And so, you know, but once again, it's just all prefaced on like, are they like bundling that money up? Like we've let Geyer walk and then given up Eric Gonzalez and a really good single A pitching prospect to basically buy a Geyer replacement to save $3 million or two and a half. And so, you know, you know, Brantley's walking, we have all these guys walking. And so basically now it's like, you know, they should actually have an operating chunk here. Like between Gomes and Geyer, you've just cleared another 10 million in expected salary. And oh, Salazar came in $500,000 below his projected ARB cost. You know, it's just like, you're setting yourself up. So like, if you're spending, if they go sign Marwan Gonzalez, if they go sign an actual starting outfielder, and then they trade Kluber for another, you know, that's a whole nother bag. But like, if you get, you know, Kluber move for a starting outfielder, then this is really different. But if the 7 million goes to like two relief lotto tickets at like one years and three, one year and 3 million and something else, then what the fuck were you doing? God. Ah. Ah. Oh, I'm, I'm killing you. You're, you're, <laughs> You're dying a slow <laughs> death, man. <laughs> Hold on. Just wait a second. I got to at least mark it this time so I don't have to spend. <laughs> Asshole. Darn it. That, that was really... not the lawyer cussing. That was Gage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I don't have it, but I'll figure it out. <laughs> it's like, where were you, Mike? Go ahead. Um, you know, it's just, what? A, I just don't. I think this is one thing where like it's really interesting to go there's like these two different process routes you can go which is like I think looking at the face of this decision like we can talk about and part of my article is like highly flawed that I wrote about Gomes which is like we can talk about surplus value and pairing these things up all day but that doesn't matter when you're trying to win a world series because you can always construct trades where you have some sort of surplus value advantage by the way we calculate surplus value but you're not actually helping yourself win a World Series in the time where you have the highest probability. You're not adding probability at the correct times. And so I think there's legitimate questions as to whether this trade adds the correct probabilities at the correct times unless this money is expended somewhere else. If it's not, it's probably just a bad deal. <laughs> well, and I, I, I guess as we look forward, I guess that at the end of the day when you're talking about a team – that's why you'd like to consider the Lindor window, the window or the, the J Ram window, the window, I think reality is setting in that the, the window right now is directly related to our starting pitching. And, you know, as, as we look forward with the, with the Gomes trade, uh, is this a precursor to a Kluber trade? And that, um, you know, we've heard of deals with them bundled together. Obviously we know the relationship that the two have, um, obviously the Indians are definitely trying to salary dump. At least that's what it looks like. Um, is this a, is this a precursor to a really busy weekend where we see the Mets, the Dodgers, um, come in and make an offer for Kluber, um, and, and to see more salary moved. That's part one. Part two of this is have the Indians by making this Jan Gomes trade, and this is kind of what I'm fearing the most, have they, showcase to major league baseball that they are desperate to dump salary. Therefore these teams are not going to give us their best offers. 
Uh, Mike, we'll start with you. I don't know. It's possible. And I, I really don't want to have the finances conversation because it's so messy. And part of me just wants to say, look, like, there's an extent to which if you never reveal your financials, people are going to be skeptical of your expenses. Like, if you're a team that never shows your financials, you just have to take the fact that, like, when you're contending, people are going to expect you to spend more than $130 million sometimes, especially when it's like, hey, Kluber's probably near the end of his peak or post-peak. Carrasco, Bauer, these are all guys who are like, we're really sliding towards late peak or post peak. And so it's like, great that we still have this window, but uh, I hate finances. We don't need to talk about it. I don't want to start a big thing. But I, if you're going to hide your finances forever, we're just not, I'm not going to do the thing where we just act like they should be capped out at 130 if we can't see them. Because look, they're getting an all-star game as payment to moving away from Chief Wahoo. It's a quid pro quo. They've had multiple playoff games hosted here. And, oh, you don't pay the players in the playoffs, so you take even more net revenue because those are all profit shares. Um, I, I just – I'm whatever. It's fine. I don't even know what I think. I didn't respond to your question. I just <laughs> – You're unhappy. I don't know what that – got to be more than this. <laughs> um, Gage, you know, <laughs> what's, what's the future hold? I mean, are the Indians – going to be forced to trade Kluber now? Um, have they done enough? Um, and can they get, you know, can they get a good payoff for Kluber? I know we talked about this in the last podcast, but now we actually have kind of a window into their thinking. I mean, obviously this, this Gomes deal, um, as Mike said, cleared away a chunk of money. You know, are they going to clear away more money? And is the point just to clear away money or are they trying to clear away money to bring in someone else? Were they trying to clear away money to give Danny Salazar his $5 million? Or Carlos Carrasco his extension? That was kind of a... Yeah, well, so the Carrasco extending off, I, I'm upset if they didn't tender Salazar because that's a $4.5 million lottery ticket that could pay huge. But the Carrasco extension kind of just... Caught me off guard because this guy is also, what, 31 years old, and you've got him controlled through his age 33 season. Isn't that what you want, where you want the pitcher controlled through, ideally? Yep. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, the, Indians, the Indians don't tend to have guys over 31, so extending a 31-year-old who already has two more years on his deal is kind of silly to me, but, you know. Okay. Don't so tend to have guys over 31. Or did you miss Derek Lowe and <laughs> – well, well, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking just, about. I'm just no, 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 term guys. Yeah, no, they they do bring in those one year flyer guys, but but I I digress. Okay, can I jump in here? So like, yeah. I don't understand this at all. The Carrasco thing, and I I know it's an opinion that's unpopular, but like the only th reason Carrasco would sign an extension is if you guarantee him the next two years. And part of the value of those below market options is that they're options. So we're going to take like the value asset and then we're going to buy, I'm assuming later options, right? Like we're going to buy the 34 and 35 options at a higher price than the 32 and 33 year old. And we're waiving those advantageous options. I just don't get it. And I love Carrasco. I'd be great if he retired in Cleveland, but it doesn't make any sense to me other than a PR play. There you go. There you go. I mean, that's what it is, right? <laughs> I don't know. Or are right. buying an extra year on Carrasco to make up for trading the year that they're trading away of Kluber in 2021? Yeah, possibly. I mean, I, I, I don't know what this is setting up. I don't. I'd love to provide insight there. I, I think the next four or five days are going to be at least interesting. I don't. I'm probably gonna. I'm. Pro, you're probably gonna have to deal with another 50 post rant from me on on text or at Slack. But I don't know. I, I guess. I guess it is what it is. Um, I don't know. I guess we can end it there. I, no, I, 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 I do have a I couple more questions about potential catchers here, but go ahead, Gage. I, I want to point something out because I've seen this, or it's kind of reverberated around Indians folks over the last couple hours after the trade of Gomes. It's not trading Mejia for Brad Hand. Oh God! Has oh. no relationship 
Papian Gomes. Don't give me that. Why would you trade Mejia? It's like what Henry said earlier. You're buying your it's those probability margin plays to try to increase your chances of winning now. And Mejia didn't have the same value now that Hand did, obviously, in the Indians front office eyes. It, I don't think that the Mejia trade has to relate to Jan Gomes at all. Well, I just wanted is, to throw is, that out there. Have, have we forgotten the fact? I mean, just even take all that out. Have we forgotten the fact that the Indians had zero intention on playing him at catcher? I mean, zero. Yeah. Zero chance of him ever playing catcher for the Cleveland Indians. But, you know, trading Mejia and trading Gomes within four months of each other ends the world. I mean, that's the most idiotic thing I've ever heard in my entire life. I don't know. I didn't mean to steal any thunder from you, Mike, because I, I no. imagine you have something to say. But I, I just – Jesus. I mean, if you're going to bitch about the Gomes trade because you're getting rid of Gomes, I totally understand that. We're a World Series team getting away the handcuff to freaking Corey Kluber. Get pissed about that. But comparing it to bringing in Brad Hand, who he freaking needed to have any chance, I mean, come on. Yeah, I, I'm not going to pretend to be sourced. Um. But at like the beginning of this year, I wrote this piece for the Athletic about Francisco Mejia's like development at catcher. And thankfully, like Zach Mizell helped me get some like really good interview quotes from Sandy Alomar and, and Dave Wallace. And like the quotes from Sandy were so striking in how little optimism they had about Francisco Mejia as a long term catching option. I mean, they were like not just the off the record sort of implied stuff, but the like literal on the record was like, fundamentally he's not there yet. And he's a 22 year old who's been in the system for six years. Like the, the fundamental frustration with where he was at as a defensive catcher was real when they dealt him inside the organization. And it wasn't just all the other like off field stuff that everybody always plays up. Cause they heard about that one fight in the dugout three effing years ago. We all know about that fight. It was fundamentally, he doesn't play as a catcher. And if he's not hitting for power, he doesn't walk. So that hit tool has to be freaking insane or he has to add power. And that just is like not a bet the Indians wanted to make. So they cashed out the asset before it depreciated. It wasn't that complex. Yeah, but you know, Cleveland Indians Twitter is complex. <laughs> you know what really sucks? I really wanted Grandel and and I didn't realize he was gonna be 16 mil a year. And like they're doing everything that you would do if you were trying to get him, but they're not. That really pisses How me. How fun would that be though? I would love that. It would have been better if they just dealt Gomes to the Dodgers and were like, okay, for another eight million a year, we're gonna go get Randall, then flip Perez and get Perez <laughs> off the roster. <laughs> you're like, all right, we just signed Grandel. All right. I, 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 I don't know. It was like two months ago, and I, I kind of flipped a text, I think maybe to both of you, maybe just to Mike, just saying just kind of offhandly, why don't we go and get Grandel? And <laughs> They've done it. Like they've done the moves to do it. Now they just, I don't know. But dude's gonna make like forty-five million. So so much for that. All right. I guess you know one last two things. Um, I I'd never got a chance. I wanted to come back to you, Mike, about um Eric Haas really quickly. Um, we talk about framing with with Perez. Um, talk to talk to everybody about Eric Haas's defensive improvements. He, we talk a lot about um offensively. You know the kind the types of improvements he's made. Um, to make himself, you know, relevant offensively at the major league level. Uh, what defensively, what are we talking about here? I mean, obviously, he's never really been talked about like a Perez, even a Gomes. Um, but, you know, every time I've talked to you, it seems like he has, uh, I don't know if it's substantially improved defensively, but but certainly been uh, an able glove behind the plate. Is this a guy that's going to be able to handle this rotation? Yeah, so like 2017, he was – the one of the five best framers in double a. I mean, I think, I don't think he's an elite framer and maybe not above average, but I think he's an average to a, maybe a tick above framer, which is great. That's awesome. The stable skill. He's a solid thrower and he's a solid blocker. He's just not on the Perez Gomes tier, but it's just, if you have an average defensive catcher who can steal you a 90 double WRC plus, that's a weird thing to reference, but like he can just be competent with the bat. And an average defensive catcher, it's like, oh, you have your starting catcher. That's basically 
what Gomes was eh, – actually, Gomes is just all over the place. Like, he was good last year. The two years before that, he couldn't ha- hit it if it wasn't nailed down. And the year before that, he was, like, one of the 20 best players in baseball. I don't, I don't know anything about Jan Gomes. He's unpredictable and old. So he should have dealt him. I, I guess that's as good a place as any to end. I mean, um, I guess going forward, Gage, and I'll kind of let you wrap things up here. Uh, you know, what's this offseason – going forward look like to you? I mean, are we in a place right now where the Indians are going to capitalize on potential added open salary, or are we really just going to um, maybe move Kluber, get a piece in replacement of him in that trade, and um, hope we get into the playoffs and miracles can happen? Because it doesn't feel like – it doesn't feel like last year where we felt like we could tread water till July and then make a big move. I'm not sure that we can do that other than with a guy like Tristan McKenzie, maybe Nolan Jones. Um, you know, what are the Indians' plans? I mean, it's, it seems a lot murkier than it was before 2018. You still need an outfielder now. I, I mean, do we, do we need to say who's in our outfield right now? Can we say who's in our outfield right now? Like Jason Kipnis is our lock. Yeah, it's gonna be fun watching him throw throw to home plate from right field or left is field. He, like, I mean, go. I I don't even I don't even know if we should open the store because is he like? Are we sure? Yeah, are we sure Diaz is playing third yet? Are we positive this is happening? Because I'm not. I know everybody else is. Nope. I'm not. I mean, I it's think Max more off at second base. Probably depends on whether Yandy learns English. Frank kind of doesn't like to oh. have to actually communicate with non-English speakers. So, Gage, I I I owe you money. <laughs> <laughs> I owe you money. I I cannot <laughs> believe this. I, I I wish I could have took a screenshot of your facial expression on that on that little blip there, Jim. <laughs> when you walked away, Mike, he made that call. I oh my. God. I just, it's so obvious. I have never, I don't even, you know what? I'm so sick of this. Like, here we go. (laughs) Here we go. It is fundamentally astounding to me that we're like, you know what? Tito doesn't do the tactical stuff that well, but he's so good with players. When you have a guy who's been up multiple times over the last three years, who literally doesn't know where he stands with the organization, because Tito can't communicate to someone who doesn't speak English, even though he's been in the game for 40 years, and he's like, you know what, I don't really need to communicate with Latin players. Why would I do that? What is that? I mean, I like, still... How incompetent are you? The only reason why Andy Diaz got to play last year is because Lindor... How ridiculous... Oh, okay. Like, I got to bring in a superstar so that my manager can tell me what's going on instead of passive aggressively ripping my defense to the media every year, even though every other person who's ever covered me thinks I'm an average to above average defender, like coaches, people like data scouts. They all think that, Oh my God. It's so. What's confusing to me uh, uh, other than that. You know, aren't you know? Rumor has it there's some other Latin American coaches on, on the on on the staff. I mean, don't they talk to each other? I don't. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. know how that's like not been a big deal. It's like, oh, this manager literally isn't talking to one of the fifteen most important players in the organization right now because he doesn't think it's worth the effort. <laughs> that's your manager, and we're like, oh, he's so great. I really liked how he deployed Michael Martinez in the playoffs. Delightful. <laughs> now, see, this is what EHT has been missing. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I think we can end it there. I think that's probably going to want to cut all of that out. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. I was going to talk. <laughs> all right. I guess since I'm going to have to cut all that out. I'm going to have to stop and think here. Do we want to say anything else? No, just close it out and be like, all right, we have nothing else to say. Mike's a drag ass. <laughs> I'm sorry. I knew I knew when I mentioned Yandy Diaz we were going to go down there. All right, we're going to wrap things up there. Uh, chances are pretty good. We'll probably have something else to talk about in the next four or five days. Will it be Corey Kluber? Will it be Trevor Bauer? I don't know. Carrasco. Actually, can we, 
I have another topic. Can we talk about this for a second? Is it is it about Trevor Bauer? Is he just like daring the Indians to trade him? Like, is that his entire Twitter persona right now? He's like, I'm going to offend so many people that you have to trade me for like 70 cents on the dollar. I, I mean, I don't know. I <laughs> I think maybe he is. I don't know. I mean, don't you think he'd like to play in L.A.? Gage, give me a take. Give me a take. You've got to do it now because if you keep walking down this road, it could really open up some doors. He just doesn't know any better. <laughs> he can't keep a lid on anything. I don't think it's any sublime or sub sub burnt message or anything to the Indians organization to trade him. I just think he doesn't know how to shut up. <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't know. I mean, he's a smart guy, though. I mean, he, obviously he knows when he you know <laughs> when he says he's better than Uber and he comes out publicly and says it, and when he says that you shouldn't trade me this year, but you should trade me next year, like hey. <laughs> I don't. I think he knows what he's doing. I mean, obviously they're talking to other teams, but I mean, I don't know. I don't think it hurts with other guy. teams. I think LA would love to have Trevor Bauer because I think LA would look at Trevor ba- Bauer as an asset that if they needed to, they could sign from from year to year. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I kind of like it. I can't help it. I like it. I don't know. I mean, Can I say a- I didn't have any problem with his? comment about being better than Kluber. He was. All right. Yeah. All right. I, I, didn't, I didn't have a problem with it. I just, you know, I don't know. I don't – Kluber probably heard it and just went about his day. You want a major conspiracy theory? I think <laughs> old old Indians core and new Indians core is at odds and, like, they're all leaving. <laughs> Hot take? You know who sits literally in a corner together? Four lockers are next to each other. We're next to each other last year. Josh Tomlin, Corey Kluber, Michael Brantley, and Jan Gomes. And three of those guys are gone, okay? Corey's going to be twiddling his thumbs in the corner now. Hey, Jason Kipnis is just going to be getting thrown out of casinos. I don't know what he's going to be doing. <laughs> Jim's like, I have to delete this entire podcast. I'm going to be for the freaking morning. I mean. <laughs> Oh man! But no, seriously, like that whole core is like gone, and it's just happening like this. And we're like, yeah, we don't care. Like, only one of those guys is still productive. So, <laughs> see you later. Uh, well, so we we found the reason for the struggles in 2018. It's he's gonna be lonely. It's not exactly a secret. Rival, rival, uh, clubhouse. Uh, hey, I think Ramirez and Lindor uh, are really a different experience for a lot of veterans in that clubhouse. Is all I'm going to say. <laughs> That's not related to anything or any fights that occurred at all. So should we talk about this? Is the maybe Tito's last year then? <laughs> yeah, this might be my last podcast <laughs> rather than it's Tito's last year. <laughs> um, Fairly certain by the end of by the end of my editing, it'll sound like a completely normal podcast. <laughs> All right, we're wrapping things up because I don't know where we're going next. All right, um, I had two podcasts in two weeks, lots of editing by me. I'm sorry. No, we're it's all, my fault. <laughs> all right. We'll see you. Uh, we'll see you soon. Go, go, Yandy. Peace. Peace.